Thank you, Steve, and uh, welcome everyone this evening. Thank you for being here. We're fortunate uh, to have United States Trade Representative Catherine Tai with us tonight, and we look forward, I look forward, to a thought-provoking conversation. As a member of the President's Cabinet, Ambassador Tai is the principal trade advisor, negotiator, and spokesperson on U.S. trade policy. Prior to her unanimous Senate confirmation, Ambassador Tai spent most of her career in public service focusing on international economic diplomacy, monitoring, and enforcement. She previously served as Chief Trade Counsel and Trade Subcommittee Staff Director for the House Ways and Means Committee in the United States Congress, where we first met each other. Before transitioning to federal service, she practiced law in the private sector, clerked for district judges, and taught English in Guangzhou, China. We're grateful to Ambassador Tai for coming tonight, for being here tonight, and I welcome you uh, to come up and uh, join me in a conversation. You know, Henry Kissinger's uh, comments are a perfect starting point to a conversation. We uh, live in a very uncertain world uh, where there's both economic and geopolitical turbulence that, at least in my experience, is at a level that is more complicated with more nodes of risk than I've seen before. U.S. business executives um, have our relationship with China really at the top of mind. And I wanted to start by asking, what the U.S. government is doing uh, to ensure a stable and productive bilateral business environment. Well, uh, Jack, it's wonderful to be here with you. And uh, when you were introduced as the 76th um, uh, Treasury Secretary for the United States, I felt um, uh, very put in my place as only the 19th U.S. <laughs> Trade Representative. Um, but uh, uh, what an incredible opportunity it is to have this conversation with you tonight in person. Um, I imagine these galas used to be a thing that uh, happened all the time and uh, the last couple years have been disruptive for all of us. Um, the amount of uh, wisdom and experience uh, in this room on China and the United States in this particular relationship um, I think is really um, uh, incredibly deep um, uh, and um, uh, very inspiring, um, especially because we find ourselves uh, in this relationship, in the context of, uh, as you say, um, a period of um, volatility, risk, I think fragility and brittleness um, that certainly I felt like in my lifetime is at the highest level I've experienced and, um, uh, you know, as you've described in yours as well. Um, so uh, in this period, um, I think that um, uh, it is an incredible priority uh, that the Biden administration places on um, being uh, strategic, effective, and uh, clear-eyed and honest in our approach to just about everything, whether it's economic policy here at home, uh, in terms of foreign relations, international economic policy, um, and certainly also this relationship in terms of um, the business environment, you know, I, I think on this, again, uh, the wisdom in this room, the experience, uh, runs uh, very, very deep. Um, I don't need to tell all of you, although I um, uh, make it a point to remind everyone I talk to how important this U.S.-China trade and economic relationship is. It is the relationship between the two largest economies in the world. It is uh, profoundly consequential, not just for our economy here in the United States, our people, our workers, our businesses, but also uh, for China and its economy, and frankly, because of the size and uh, importance of both of these economies for the entire world. And so I think in terms of the experiences, um, the insights of the business community what we really need is the same from you, um, clear-eyed uh, honesty and communication around where you see opportunities, but especially at this time 
where you see the challenges. Um, for those of us who have been involved in US-China relations, trade and economic and more broadly, I think we've seen, and you know, seeing Dr. Kissinger speak and hearing him uh, just reminds us of that historical context and the growth and evolution of this particular relationship. Um, I, 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 I imagine, as I get a chance to speak to more of you, that there is a sense today that there is some aspect of the hope and optimism of decades past that we no longer have. And you know, on that, I think that, uh, again, with respect to the business community, we really need you to be honest with us. Um, there is a sense of nostalgia, I know, that uh, many have who have been working in this area, but that um, clear-eyed candor around today's situation is going to be extremely important to our ability to navigate this relationship responsibly over these next years. You know, the uh, trade relationship uh, between the US and China is a challenging one. It was challenging in my time at Treasury. It's challenging now. Um, I wanted to ask you a two-part question. Uh, one, what would the ideal relationship between the United States and China look like? And um, you know, we hear a lot of reporting about discussions about the tariffs and questions about the impact of the tariffs. Um, if, if you can talk to us a little bit about how that fits into the broader trade strategy. So on your first question, I think that's a really very interesting question around what the ideal relationship should be. Um, I think essentially what you're asking is, what is the vision for where we are taking this relationship? And I think that's slightly different from the ideal. And, and I'm fighting against a little bit the premise of that question because, again, I think that um, there are traps in imagining what the ideal might be because the reality today is less than what that ideal is. The fact of the matter is, um, in terms of the relationship between our economies, um, that there is an intense um, competition um, that is uh, happening and an increased sense of uh, insecurity and uh, vulnerability in this particular relationship. Um, I think, from my view, uh, in terms of where we are trying to go, uh, with respect to this relationship, and then more broadly, in terms of the global marketplace, uh, in terms of um, uh, the international trading system, what I have observed over the last um, years and few decades is an erosion of confidence, an erosion of confidence certainly in the most recent few years around um, that global economy that we, we took for granted um, working like clockwork that is disrupted in many ways right now. But beyond that, an erosion in the confidence that the global economy operates in a fair way. And I think around that second erosion, that erosion of confidence in the fairness of the competition, that the US-China trade relationship looms very, very large. And so in order to get to the place where we can build more confidence, I think we really have to take head on that aspect of the US-China trade and economic relationship. So when I worked in, uh, on these issues as a public official, I came to be aware that there were two sides to that. There was what was done to us and what responsibility we had uh, in our own economy. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the kind of line between that? I mean, I, I, when I look back and say, what could we have done better over the years I was in government? We could have done more to make sure that the benefits of free trade were spread more equally through the economy. Um, and uh, in a world where, and we'll talk about some of these issues more specifically, uh, where tariffs are hurting consumers, but the fear of trade is so high that it's difficult to do anything about it, how do you, how do you kind of separate those issues? I think it's a, um, it, it's a great um, topic to think about um, what are the choices that we made along the way and uh, where have we fallen short in terms of uh, pursuing trade policies um, that um, uh, are, are robustly supported here at home. 
Um, but I think that, you know, trade, like so many things in life, um, it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. It takes more than one to do this thing called trade and have a relationship. And so, you know, I also want to reflect, and I think that this is something where, again, um, uh, many in this room uh, will have their own experiences, but there are choices that China has made over time as well. And I think it is important to have this two-way conversation. Um, uh, there was a period of time when, uh, rightly or wrongly, the outside world, including uh, many in the United States, uh, were hopeful to see um, uh, reforms in China, economic reforms, political reforms, uh, that did not end up happening. And part of what I want to um, think on is that uh, that is the result of choices. I think it was a, a little bit less than 10 years ago that um, the uh, uh, business community, uh, foreign business communities, including the American one, um, operating uh, in China, uh, started um, to issue reports indicating that concerns and anxieties around the business environment for foreign companies, how welcome foreign business felt in China, and that um, there was an erosion there in the feelings that um, uh, things were um, positive or, or then that they were trending negative. So, um, you know, I, I think that in this particular moment where we are again hearing concerns um, from the business community around um, the um, uh, operation uh, and the role of state-owned enterprises in the Chinese economy, um, uh, subsidies practices, uh, preferences given through uh, procurement um, uh, practices, um, that um, uh, uh, there are really important conversations that need to be had, including with and between the business communities around um, uh, how choices that we are making in, in each of our respective economies are impacting each other's opportunities and the opportunities for our people. Switching from US-China to our partners and allies that you've spent so much time uh, focusing on, uh, you've said that your office is uh, in an era of engagement. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what you and the administration are doing to strengthen ties, uh, trade ties, uh, with other countries? Absolutely. Um, it turns out that, um, and I think this is something that uh, I'm realizing that uh, you've probably known for a very long time, and it's not new for uh, the people in this room, um, that uh, there are a lot of things that make the world go round, but one of the most important things that makes the world go round, and that includes the economy, is relationships. And so in this era of engagement, and it's our office, but it's certainly at the direction of President Biden in terms of America being back uh, and engaged with the rest of the world, um, I think we've also, as an administration, described it as uh, an era of relentless diplomacy. It is about showing up it is about engaging our partners, not just telling them about what we are thinking and doing, but even more importantly, listening to them about what their interests and priorities, anxieties, and hopes are, <clears throat> and um, uh, working together on a vision for, again, how to rebuild the confidence in the global economy and that confidence and fairness uh, in our trading system. I want to talk for a minute about CPTPP, um, uh, and I won't put it in the uh, in, in personal terms. As you know, I worked on TPP quite extensively. Um, but former uh, senior U.S. defense officials have advocated for America joining CPTPP. Um, is there any chance of that happening? So you know, it's too bad the former um, defense officials aren't here because the question that I would like to ask when I hear that is. What is it about the CPTPP that um, uh, you think uh, makes sense for us to pursue today? Because if it is about working with our um, uh, allies, our partners, and our friends on um, economic engagement, 
um, and uh, uh, working towards uh, shared goals and interests. Uh, we are doing that right now through uh, what um, our administration um, uh, has launched, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Um, you know, what I have found over time is, um, uh, I, I imagine defense officials who I don't have as much uh, opportunity to cross paths with, but certainly uh, those in uh, foreign policy and foreign relations, um, that um, when they talk and think about trade, they're, they're sort of thinking in the macro and the large picture. We should be economically engaged. The fact of the matter is that, you know, you have people like me <laughs> and uh, my lawyers and my negotiators around because um, uh, what's in the details uh, really matters. Uh, the devil is in the details, but the angels are also in those details. And from my perspective, you know, the distinction between what we are doing with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework and uh, what is now the CPTPP is context. The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is the economic engagement program that the United States is bringing to uh, friends and partners in the Indo-Pacific region that is fit for the purpose of engaging meaningfully today. And today in 2022, we are frankly still grappling with the effects of COVID. Our supply chains are still working out their kinks. Um, we have, on top of all of that, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the impacts on world energy markets and food markets. What I hear from our trading partners through our era of engagement is the desire to find opportunities to work together to promote in our um, economies um, resilience, sustainability, and inclusion. Um, and I think that these parameters are quite different from um, the pressures and the aspirations uh, that we were pursuing just five, seven, ten years ago when we were negotiating the, what is now the CPTPP. When you think about resilience, um, it, it has a whole different meaning uh, since COVID. Um, I, I think it, it is something that's now a, a kind of a given that we can't ever be in a place where people need medical equipment and protective gear and because the world isn't flowing in a normal way, we have no ability to meet that need. But at the same time, uh, that doesn't mean we go completely to the other extreme and not engage with the world or not even engage between the United States and China. How do you see balancing those two considerations? Um, and have not having resilience become an excuse for breaking things apart? I think that's a great question. It's a profoundly consequential because so many of us are grappling with it right now. I'm sure that the business community, um, everyday people, um, to your point about the struggle through, especially those early days and months of uh, the COVID lockdown here, um, <clears throat> everybody needing uh, masks and gloves and gowns, um, the, the sudden spike in demand for something like ventilators and just simply not having enough in the world. On top of that, what we discovered was uh, over the course of um, the last several years and decades of um, uh, globalization um, that you know the um, uh, maximization of efficiencies meant that um, a lot of our production had become concentrated. And so a lot of our uh, mask production glove production, um, uh, we found was, was concentrated in, um, in China. And, you know, at a time when China was the first country to lock down in response to COVID, that meant that there was a significant supply shortage and a shock for the rest of us. That sense of vulnerability and insecurity, I think, colors a lot of what we are experiencing today. And we've seen it translated to semiconductor chips. We've seen it in a number of other supply chains that um, uh, continue to uh, wreak havoc uh, on uh, the global economy today. So uh, what is interesting is um, we are now having a lot of conversations about resilience and what does that mean? Does that mean bring everything home so that you never have to rely on another country again? And I think that there are not that many people who are pursuing that particular vision. I don't think that's what resilience means because, frankly, if you bring everything home, you've created a, a concentration, <laughs> right? Yeah. The same kind of concentration. So I think more broadly speaking, what we're talking about is um, 
we need more options and we need more choices. And we need a global economy that's incentivizing firms and countries, actors in our economies to be solving not just for efficiency, like you keep efficiency in the equation by all means, but also solving for uh, resilience. And on this, I'll tell you that um, in my trips to New York and engaging with um, uh, the titans of the finance world, uh, I have been particularly impressed. Uh, one, I'm inclined to be impressed because I don't know very much about your world. I'm a trade person. I'm not a, not a treasury person. I know my place in the world. But um, the, the second more relevant point is that um, uh, as far as I've gathered, in the world of finance, um, you're looking at risk a lot of the time. You're managing risks. And I think that with respect to the global economy and this issue of resilience, what we are looking at is how do you uh, incentivize uh, economic and trade rules that take into account risk? So um, we have about five minutes left, and I wanted to ask you two more questions. So I'm going to take the chance. Uh, they're very different, um, but not entirely. Um, contact with uh, counterparts in China. Um, uh, that's been uh, challenging uh, for the last few years, and now there are changes in China in terms of the leadership structure. Um, can you talk to us a bit about how you see uh, th that unfolding so that we can perhaps be in a place where there's the perception that people are talking to each other as much as they need to, to avoid misunderstandings and, uh, unavo and avoidable conflict? And then finally, maybe on a personal note, you spent a lot of years in China, teaching in China, you have family ties. Um, and talk a little bit about your understanding of the relationship from your own personal perspective. Okay, um, let me keep myself organized and I can see the, I can see the <laughs> clock ticking down, so I'll pace myself to you. On your first question um, about um, uh, uh, contacts between the U.S. government and the Chinese government, right? this profoundly consequential relationship. Um, I think that uh, probably in this room, uh, more eyes were following the um, 20th Party Congress than, you know, on average uh, in, in, in the United States. Um, but obviously, important changes are happening in Beijing, uh, and uh, we are paying attention. Um, I would just say that in terms of this being an era of engagement and relentless diplomacy, um, that from my perspective, um, and I believe this to be true uh, of my partners in the Biden administration, that, that applies also to the U.S.-China relationship. And so we will see uh, how um, uh, uh, these um, uh, changes are translated into personnel and policies, um, but uh, I feel very confident that uh, we are ready um, to have uh, those engagements. Um, on, the, on the personal side question, in terms of my own experience um, uh, studying China, um, studying the language, um, following the ins and outs, um, I also, the first time I ever traveled to China was 1991. Um, in 1991, the streets of Beijing were filled with bicycles. The last time I had a chance to visit China was in 2014 when uh, China was hosting uh, the APEC year. And uh, it was, again, um, the meetings that um, I, I got to tag along to were in Beijing. And um, uh, there were not that many bicycles that I saw on the streets. And in fact, what I saw, uh, I saw something I'd never seen before, which was a, a gold-plated Bentley on the streets of Beijing. So, um, you know, uh, a, a, a lot has changed in this time. And I guess what I would say is, in this moment, um, which is a consequential one, and it is going to be really, really important for us to bring that sense of context and history. We are all products of our history. We are, we are, we are um, uh, living in a world that is the product of a shared history in terms of this relationship. And I, I really want to impress with everyone um, this notion that um, nothing is predestined. We are the products of our history, and we are the products of the choices that we make. And I hope that on both sides of this important and complex relationship, that there is that uh, shared seriousness of purpose and a consciousness that um, what happens next 
is a result of decisions that we both are making. Well, I think there's one thing that all, everyone in this room can agree on, that the issues we're talking about are highly consequential to the United States, to China, and to the economic and geopolitical stability of the world. And very much appreciate your taking time out of your schedule to spend the evening with us here tonight. And uh, we certainly uh, hope uh, that that vision of uh, greater um, uh, progress uh, can be realized. And uh, please join me in thanking Ambassador Tai. Thank you so much.